Greetings all, this is Rick Levine with your August 2023 astrological forecast. Before we get to the actual astrology for the month ahead, I have a few things I'd like to run by you rather quickly. There will be links in the comments in the top pinned comment below so that you can find your way easily to these events if you want more information. First of all, I'd like to remind everyone that I will be back at Soul Food Coffee House in Redmond, Washington on Friday evening, August 4th, and that will start at 6.30 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. This event will be live streamed, and so if you go to my YouTube channel at that time, there will be um, the, the live stream on YouTube for those of you who don't live in the Seattle area. For those of you who do and who have never attended before, this is a near-monthly event when I'm in town, which is usually at Soul Food Coffee House. It's a fun evening. I talk about the month ahead, kind of like I'm doing now, but I usually focus on some different things. And then I do charts live for a few people in attendance. It's a lot of fun. It's a free event. Uh, you can uh, donate to the store if you'd like to at the door. Um, and there is a link below for Soul Food Coffee House, and I'll see many of you there on Friday evening at 6.30. Secondly, the Canadian Astrology Conference is on September 15th through the 17th, and that'll be at the Calgary Plaza Hotel in Calgary, Alberta. Um, the conference is Earth Wisdom Astrology, and I will be the keynote speaker at that event and will also be offering a workshop on Sunday afternoon uh, once the actual event is, uh, is done. And for those of you who don't want to attend the entire event, you can still come to the workshop. And for those of you who want to extend the weekend. The workshop is there, and I'll have the link below um, for those of you who want to follow up on more information. Um, there'll be an, a stellar group of uh, speakers aside from myself. Nadia Shah will be there, and Gashida um, Kiwak, who uh, brings with her the, um, the uh, First Nation uh, Indigenous Teachings, and um, there'll be other astrologers there, including William Morris, a medical astrologer, acupuncturist, um, uh, Jeannie Picasso, um, Alex um, Trenowith from England, and our own Donna Young here from Canada. And so this is going to be a fun event, and I look forward to seeing many of you there. Then, on the weekend of October 13th through the 15th, I will be back at Omega Institute. Uh, this is just north of New York City in Rhinebeck, New York. And I'll be co-teaching a weekend with the uh, wonderful Rachel Lang. And this weekend is entitled Liberating Venus, Love, and Abundance. And it's about awakening the power to receive using astrology. And uh, we're going to explore uh, more meaningful relationships, how to achieve track them and how to increase your, your access to abundance, basic Venusian uh, um, uh, issues, if you will, um, and, and how does one go about embodying Venus, and what is Venus, and how does the astrological Venus work, and we'll offer insights about our own experiences of uh, love, finance, pleasure, sensuality, um, but of course Venus is also um, brings up the, the polar opposites issues of fear and shame that can lead to self-judgment. And, um, and so we'll be exploring the planet of Venus from, from here on Earth and learn more about Venus in your own birth chart and discover how to have more meaningful relationships and working with astrology really as a healing modality. Because when we liberate Venus, we also open to the power of receptivity in order to attract more goodness and pleasure into our lives. So that's October 13th through 15th at Omega Institute, just north of New York City. And again, the link is down below. And then the last thing I would like to mention is that there are still some openings for my 10-day uh, retreat 
in Goa, India, and this is sponsored by Heaven and Earth Workshops. And um, the event is Initiation into Astrology. This is my 11th Heaven and Earth Workshop sponsored event that I've done in geez, nearly two decades. And, and this is basically a way to jump into astrology, whether you're a practicing professional or or even if you're new to astrology, um, there's something here for everyone. It's a full immersion. There's a lot of experiential work, a lot of, uh, we'll do some astro drama. There'll be some uh, days in which we'll do some events that are um, f- to get a taste and a flavor of Goa, India, which is a very magical part of India. It's on the Arabian Sea. We're about a five minute walk, if that, down to a very beautiful and swimmable beach. Um, we'll do an event event on the water. We'll go to a pretty one of the largest outdoor marketplaces you can possibly imagine. Um, we'll also take a trip up to an organic spice farm. Uh, it, it's fantastic. I've taught at this place before. The venue is familiar. Uh, it's an Ayurvedic healing spa. It's wonderful enough that when I go there, I spend an extra few uh, days uh, afterwards just hanging out in this magical, beautiful spot. Uh, that's December 6th through the 16th, Goa, India. And uh, and like I said before, there are still some spots opening. It is filling up and that's um, December 6th to 16th. And I look forward to seeing many of you there also. And that is it when it comes to uh, events. Thank you for um, uh, listening to to me as I uh, share with you some of these events. I know that many of you just want to jump right into the forecast, and of course, you're always free to scroll ahead. But for many of you, this is the way you find out what I'm doing and where I'm going to be, because I know that that there is interest. So, with no further ado, uh, let's jump into the month of August, which I think is going to prove to be an intriguing month. You know, on the surface, there's not a lot of activity in in August, and I think that becomes part of the meaning of the month itself. Uh, You know, we start off the month and Venus is already retrograde. We'll detail that a little bit more in a few minutes. But we also have, during the month, we have Mercury turning retrograde. Mercury doesn't turn retrograde um, until um, the 23rd. But it's important to understand that even though it doesn't turn retrograde until the 23rd, um, it is already kind of in motion with some of the stuff that will come up. Why is that? Well, let's actually talk about the Mercury thing just for a few minutes, and then we'll see it again as we go through the charts. But Mercury actually entered the sign of Virgo on July 28th. And by the way, for the record, I am recording this on the evening of July 31st. Um, So tomorrow um, is the first day of August, and we will start off in a few minutes looking at August's chart. But Mercury moved into Virgo, and Mercury likes being in Virgo. I mean, it's really, it's not only its domicile, but it's also an exaltation um, because it's opposite its uh, fall in Pisces, the opposite sign. And so Mercury in Virgo is very powerful. It's very profound. And unlike Mercury in Gemini, it wants to apply what it knows. It just doesn't want to connect the dots. It actually wants to make use of the information that it has, and it wants real information. Now, normally, Mercury whizzes through a sign in two to three weeks, But because Mercury turns retrograde on August 23rd, that in fact it will stay in Virgo all the way through October 4th, which means that we'll end up with Mercury um, in Virgo for all of August and all of September and a few days at the end of July and a few days at the beginning of October. And so this really emphasizes the whole mercurial function. Mercury itself turns retrograde on August 23rd, and it turns direct, and it does that at 21 degrees and 51 minutes, 21 degrees and 51 minutes, nearly 22 degrees of Virgo. And then it backs all the way up 
to 8 degrees of Virgo, it backs up 14 degrees in 23 days. Mercury is retrograde for 23, uh, 23 days. So it's retrograding pretty fast, meaning that it, it approaches um, nearly um, nearly two degrees a day as it's in the middle of its retrograde um, phase. So as Mercury is retrograding, it retrogrades all the way back to eight degrees of Virgo. And then it turns direct on September 15th, and then it moves out of Virgo into Libra on October 4th, as we said before. Now, the reason why we have all these dates is that because we know that that Mercury will back up all the way, once it retrogrades, it'll back all the way up um, to eight degrees of Virgo on September 15th. What that means is that when Mercury going direct now at the beginning of August, when it reaches eight degrees of Virgo, which it does on August 3rd, once it reaches that eight degrees of Virgo on August 3rd, it's then going to move through those four, then yeah, move through those 14 degrees. It's then going to turn retrograde, going back through that same 14 degrees, and then go direct again and move out of that shadow area um, on September 5th, uh, uh, no, on September 29th. Uh, it turns direct on September 15th. So the thing to understand is that if you have planets in your natal chart between 8 degrees and 21, almost 22 degrees of Virgo, um, that you're going to get that Mercury, transiting Mercury, conjoining your natal planet once, twice, three times as it moves forward and backward through that shadow area again and then forward the third and final time. And in fact, if you have planets between 8 and 21 degrees of any mutable sign, whether it's Virgo or its opposite sign Pisces or the two signs that are square to, um, to Virgo, and that would be Gemini and Sagittarius, you'll still get that Mer uh, Mercury transit three times either conjunct, opposed, or square to your natal planet. And of course, if you have a planet between 8 and 22 degrees of another Earth sign, meaning Taurus or Capricorn, then you'll get that Mercury transit trining your natal planet. And of course, you can do the same with other aspects, but those, those are the main ones. So the Mercury retrograde is important even though it doesn't turn retrograde until the 23rd, a lot of August is setting up things that will not play through until Mercury is moving the third and final time direct in September, uh, from September 15th through the 29th, as it's moving back through that shadow the third and final time. It doesn't mean that things aren't going to happen now, now that, you know, while Mercury is moving through the shadow area for the first time through the month of July. It just means that it's going to take time for these things to play on through. Now, while we're talking about retrogrades, let's also remember that Venus is retrograde for the entire month. And in fact, Venus actually um, moving through Leo, Venus entered Leo back at the beginning of June, um, and it began moving through its shadow period um, in, I guess, around June 19th. Um, and Venus turned retrograde on July 22nd. It doesn't turn direct until September 3rd. So for the entire month of August, Venus is moving retrograde uh, back through its shadow. Um, and then it won't leave its shadow until October 8th. Now, this is intriguing because we have both Venus and Mercury retrograde at the same time, um, and certainly mo both moving through their shadows through most of the month um, of, of, of August, uh, yeah, most, most of the month of August, with Venus retrograding back through its shadow, having already gone through it the first time, and Mercury moving through it for the first time um, through, um, through its retrograde toward the end of this month, toward the end of August. 
What this means is that these planets are not making as many aspects as they might normally make in a month um, because when a planet turns retrograde or direct, it has to slow down in order to make that, that turn. And when it moves retrograde, it's not typically moving as fast as it can or does move when it's direct. And so from that standpoint, Mercury and Venus are both kind of giving us um, a remedial work to do. And I think August is going to be an important month, but it's not going to be an important month because new, totally unexpected, exciting things out of the blue are going to happen. Although there is some action that does involve Uranus, and we'll get to that in a little bit also. Um, but largely, the, the aspects from the faster moving planets are fewer because of Venus and Mercury's retrogrades. Mars, on the other hand, is moving through Virgo and actually reaches Libra by the end of the month. And that's one of the two planets that change signs during the, the month. The only planets that change signs all month of, of August are Mars moving into Libra on August 27th and the Sun moving from Leo into Virgo on August 23rd. But Mercury and Venus do not change signs because even though they normally do once a month or even more often, they're both in that retrograde direct um, uh, phase. And Mars does change signs, as I mentioned, but Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto um, are all either slow moving enough that they don't change signs often, or as um, Uranus goes, Uranus will be turning um, retrograde later this month, and we'll get to that also. Um, the actual Uranus station retrograde is on August 28th, and um, but that also means that, that Uranus is not moving very fast all month. In fact, uh, Uranus begins the month at 22 and three quarter degrees of Taurus, 22 degrees and 46 minutes of Taurus, and it turns retrograde on the 28th at 23 degrees of Taurus in five minutes, which means that Uranus doesn't even move one third or it moves barely one third of a degree for the entire entire month and um, and so I the because the outer planets are not moving very fast right now um, I mean Saturn has just turned retrograde Pluto is retrograding it does not move it's not moving fast in fact Pluto which um, squared the nodes exactly as the nodes were moving from the um, from the Taurus Scorpio axis back into the Aries Libra axis uh, in July, um, the last part of July. F for all practical purposes, <laughs> Pluto is still squaring the nodes, which means that we'll have a little bit of action still from this very, very deep and profound and powerful power struggle that may be being played out in political realms uh, more than anything else, but certainly can appear um, in relationship dimensions or in our individual lives also. But Pluto is retrograde. Um, Neptune is retrograde, also not moving very fast. Uh, Uranus is, as I mentioned before, it's stationing the end of the month. So, so Uranus is barely moving at all. Saturn has just turned retrograde. It's also not moving very fast right now. It's um, at five degrees um, and 40 minutes retrograde, five degrees um, of Pisces at the beginning of the month. And at the end of the month, it's backed up barely two degrees to three, three degrees, three and a half degrees of, of Pisces. Um, and so Saturn isn't moving very fast either. And, and even Jupiter um, is not moving very fast right now because Jupiter is slowing down already. It turns retrograde um, in, um, in September, um, but although it's moving direct all through August, it barely moves two degrees for the entire month. So here's the deal. It may feel like we're not moving a whole lot into new territory, which on some level is kind of perfect because 
it's summer, summer vacation. Theoretically, this should be a little bit of a downtime for many people, not for everyone, of course. Um, and like I said earlier, there is some action that occurs, um, and we'll get to that in, in, in a bit. It's also notable that we have uh, what's called the blue moon, the second full moon in, in a month, because we open up August with a full moon, which means that we close it also 28 days, uh, 29 days later with another full moon. So that's basically the lay of the land for the month. Um, we're also going to talk about the only outer planet to outer planet aspect that's made. Normally, when we look at aspects, we look at, we say the moon is square Venus. In other words, it's the faster planet to the slower planet. And when we look at the aspects for the month, there's only one aspect that's out beyond Mars to another planet out beyond Mars, and that is Saturn making a half square to Chiron, which normally wouldn't be something we would spend a whole lot of time on, but because it's the only outer planet or trans-Martian planet, in other words, a planet out beyond Mars, it's the only planet that, the, um, the only aspect that's being made all month, um, and it is mid-month. We'll, we'll talk about that also uh, um, uh, in a little bit when we get there. But Saturn half square to Chiron certainly um, can pose some, some issues Issues when it comes to um, finding ways to either bring the truth, uh, to teach, um, to bring stability, uh, to uh, find a place to forgive or to understand those people who may not think as we do, whatever it is that you or I may think, that Saturn, that square, uh, that semi squaring. Um, um, Chiron uh, can show some difficulties in coming to common ground, I, I, I believe. So with no further ado, let's look at the chart for August 1st. And we can see that when we look at the chart for August 1st, at noon, we are already incredibly close um, to that full moon, that that Aquarius full moon, and 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 here actually, what we're going to do is we're going to change the view of this so that we can actually look at the chart for um, the um, the full moon, which is at eleven thirty one a.m. And remember, all times that I give here will be Pacific Daylight. Time. When we look at a chart for a lunation, a new moon, or a full moon, we first want to see does the uh, moon itself make any or is it pushing toward making any aspects with any other planets? And we do note that the moon is coming into a square with Jupiter from 9 degrees of Aquarius to almost um, 14 degrees uh, of, of Taurus. So um, it, it, it's four degrees away, which means it's about eight hours away but um, from happening at the moment, at the time of the actual um, um, full moon itself. And, and this is important because I think this sets up the potential for overreacting and overdoing. Normally, the Aquarius full moon is not very overly emotional. It's more logical and conceptual. But here, because of its square to Jupiter, I think we may see some of that. In fact, the uh, sun forms its square with Jupiter on August 6th. Um, and so it'll take a few days for the sun to get, reach that square exactly. But I think as we move into August, where we're feeling this potential for things getting bigger, things getting more. And yet at the same time, we also have um, on August 1st, a few other very important aspects that are not specifically aspects to the moon or from the moon, but they're aspects that are supporting the, en the energy of the moment. First of all, we have Mars making a, um, a, a square and a half 
uh, to Pluto. And this is significant because Pluto is right at that point of the bending. Last month, we had the sun opposing Pluto and both of them squaring the nodal axis. And we're getting Mars now at that point of uh, the kind of the point of Thor, where it's making um, a half square to one uh, side of the nodal axis to the south node and a square and a half to the other. And I think that this can be really exacerbating. I think that this can stir up some anger, some words, some, uh, you remember Mars is the god of war and it's conflictive, but here's the other thing. And that is also at this full moon, Mars is making a trine to Jupiter, which is arguably a positive energy, although, again, we can overdo it. In, in, in some ways, although Mars trying Jupiter is really like, like the upbeat spirit of a winning sports team that knows it can't be defeated and its confidence brings it through, and I think we can all glean a little bit of confidence from this aspect at this full moon, on the other hand, we can also be so bold and even arrogant that we may stir up trouble where there doesn't have to be any. And, and, the, and the other thing that's going on at the, uh, on the day of the full moon is that Mercury at five degrees of a Virgo is moving opposite Saturn at five degrees of Pisces. And this is a bit of a more serious thing. It's a, it, 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 there's like running into the truth that we can't deny. All right. I know that no matter how in your face the truth is, if you believe something strong enough, you can deny the truth anyhow. But that Mercury opposition to Saturn makes it difficult. It forces us to um, kind of like like it, it rubs our nose in in the shit in the in the whatever it is that's not right, and and we can steal up against it and hold our incorrect position even stronger. But this is really a uh, reality check in some ways to see what it is that we might be believing that isn't true so we can readjust what we think we know or what we know in order to, accompl in, in order to accommodate um, a more um, uh, in, a, a position with a higher integrity, with more truth in it. Um, I don't think it's going to be an easy full moon, though, because of the Mars sesquisquare to Pluto and it's sesquisquare to the, to the north node and semisquare to the south node. And also because I think that Mars can even exacerbate things, even though it's trying to Jupiter would normally be a positive event. And of course, Mercury's opposition to um, Saturn. Serious day. And I think there's a lot going on that is in some ways the harbinger of a big month. But I actually think that a lot of the things that are really big that we're expecting to happen or we'd like to happen may get sloughed off, may get put off a little bit until both Mercury and Venus turn direct. Um, and so we may have to wait for September for some of the bigger pieces to, to fall. Now, as we move on, on August 2nd, the moon, which was in Aquarius, the full moon in Aquarius, on August 2nd, the, um, the moon moves into Pisces. The moon moves into Pisces at 8.05 p.m. And again, we're looking at an Aries rising chart. So there is no horizon um, in the chart. There, there, we can't use houses, uh, but the signs and the planets are, are all correct. Um, the moon moves into Pisces. And while the moon is in Pisces, it's going to catch up to Saturn. And so we might have a bit of serious uh, uh, things, to, uh, serious things to deal with um, on the second and third as the moon is moving through Pisces and even moving not only through Pisces, but also then um, opposite Mercury and eventually opposite Mars. Um, but it's really lunar energy that is that is in operation on the first um, on this uh, on the, I'm sorry, on the second and then on the third when the moon actually catches up to that opposition to Mars. And then by August 4th, we have the sun making a square and a half 
with Neptune. This may add a little bit of confusion into the picture, especially since the late Pisces moon is also going to be conjoining Neptune. Uh, the moon itself will move into Aries at 8.19 p.m. on Friday, August 4th. But And that might be a little bit of a refreshment, uh, a little bit of a clearing of the air. But until then, I think that that Friday, August 4th might be a, a little bit confusing and might be a little bit, have a little bit of uncertainty, which of course also leaves room for heightened imagination, dreams, fantasy, and so on. Uh, remember, there's few aspects in astrology that are always good or negative or positive. It's really how we work with it and what we do with it. That is August 4th. Um, by August 5th, we still have the moon moving through Aries. Um, and uh, other than that, there's not a lot happening, but we're beginning to feel that sun squaring Jupiter even more. Remember, that makes that exact square um, on Sunday the 6th. But we're already feeling it here um, for sure. And also on the 6th at 1124, um, uh, let's move ahead to the 6th here. On the, on the 6th at 1124 p.m., the moon moves from Aries into Taurus, which can settle things down a bit more. But we also have the sun making its exact square to Jupiter, which on one hand can be confidence and exciting. Um, and we also have um, Venus making a square with Uranus, um, which is not exact for another few days, not exact until the 9th. But it's interesting because we have the sun um, making its exact square with Jupiter, the sun in Leo, Jupiter in Taurus, and Venus retrograding back into its square with Uranus, um, which again is exact in, in, a, in a couple of days, in a few days on, what did I say, August 9th. But here's the thing, and that is that as Venus is backing through this square to Uranus, it's going to remind us of the fact, and I said at the beginning that I would get back to these things um, a, a little bit later, but, but what it does is it reminds us that when a planet goes direct, retrograde, direct, often aspects are repeated three times. And which aspects are being repeated here? Well, it is, in fact... Um, Venus, which um, squared Uranus when it was moving direct at the beginning of July, July 2nd, there was a Venus-Uranus square. Now on August 9th, retrograde Venus squares Uranus again, and it'll square Uranus again for the third and final time once it's going direct, moving toward, moving out of its shadow on um, September 29th. But right now, we're in the midst of this period of time between the beginning of July and the end of September, and we're getting a bump on this um, Venus squaring Uranus, which is kind of exciting us into thinking that maybe we want things that are new and different and exciting, whether we act on them or not, is not the issue. It's the fact that we are intrigued or, or attracted to those things which are normally outside of the box. So that's the Venus squaring Uranus. And, and while we're here, I just want to mention, and I'll bring this up again in a few minutes, that back on June 11th, Venus squared Jupiter. And on August 22nd, retrograde Venus will come back and square Jupiter again, like the sun is squaring it now today um, uh, on, on the, the 6th. Um, and so it's important to understand that these events are not separate from one another. They pull each other's um, rhythms and, and uh, dynamics um, back around, back in. And so as Venus retrogrades back to its square to Jupiter by the 22nd, and then it moves through that square, it turns direct, and by September 16th, it makes its third and final square to Jupiter. All of this is about the Leo to Taurus square. That's why we're focusing on all of these right now, even though we'll, we'll separate them out by the actual dates when they, when they occur. 
And the reason is that that Leo and Taurus are both fixed signs. And the sun in Leo wants to just shine its light. It wants to be bright. It wants to it wants to love and be seen for the love that it gives or the light that it gives. Venus in Leo is also very similar in that same manner. It's it, it's shining its light. Um, it's it wants the, the love to be out in the open. But when each of those two planets, um, the Sun and Venus, square Jupiter and Uranus, the Sun is squaring um, Jupiter uh, today um, on August 6th, but it squares Uranus on the 15th. And Venus will square Uranus moving backwards. Venus will square um, Uranus on the 9th, and then it'll square Jupiter on the 22nd. And all of this is about conflict between what I know I need and where I know I need to be the practical, grounded Taurus side and the part that can be excited about whatever the the intention is in the moment. And there can be some conflict that comes and goes and comes and goes all month because of these events. So that's August 6th. And as we move forward to August 8th, we have Mercury making its square and a half to Pluto. Remember, we had Mars doing that um, back at the the beginning of the month on the 1st. And now Mercury is moving right into that same position. And again, that's important because as Mercury is making that square and a half to Pluto, it's also making a half square to the south node and a square and a half to the north node. And so all of this is tied in together and it re-exacerbates, it re-stimulates, it reactivates the communication Mercury with the power that is unwilling to give up its power, um, the, 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 the power struggles that are going on, again, whether it's in our individual lives or whether it's being played out on a more global or political um, uh, spectrum. Then on Aug- oh, and, and then, yeah, and then on August 9th, the moon moves into Gemini at 6.05 a.m. And we also have the exact Venus square Uranus that I talked about just a few minutes ago. The sun is moving away from its square uh, to Jupiter, uh, but Venus is actually squaring exactly. And so it's pulling in all of that Taurus uh, to Leo square energy. On the 9th, we also have Mercury making a trine to uh, Jupiter. And this Mercury, remember, Mars made a trine to Jupiter at the beginning of the month, and now Mercury is making a trine to Jupiter. And so it's interesting how we're getting these these plays and replays of similar energy, but with different planetary players or the planet retrograding over the same point again, but that Mercury to Jupiter may be a day, again, when we, if we have a speech to give or if we have a performance or an interaction, we can be so on point because we're really, we have that confidence from, from Jupiter that's being fed by the trine from our intellect, our speech, Mercury. But The warning is that just because it's a trine doesn't mean it's good because we can also overstate something. We can exaggerate to the point of actually lying, even if we didn't mean to exaggerate so much that what we were saying was untrue. But of course, the flip side of that is that other people may be doing that too. So while Mercury is trining Jupiter, we need to put up our discriminating antenna a little bit higher so that we don't fall victim into either saying more or than we intended or exaggerating more than we should, or hearing what someone said and taking it as truth because we want to, or because we believe in them, when the fact of the matter is that they are deceiving us by by stretching the truth or exaggerating or by overstating a position. So that's the dance on on, on August 9th. But there's some excitement about it because of that Venus square Uranus. And and I I don't think we can get away from the excitement, even, even if we end up being 
Nah, trapped isn't a good word, even if we fall victim to our own enthusiasm. Um, you know, so we just need to pay attention um, around that period of time. Um, then on August um, uh, 11th, we have the moon um, moving into Cancer at 3.52 p.m. And our energy goes a little bit more indrawn now. Before with the moon in Gemini, we were more outgoing and talkative. And of course, that while the moon was in Gemini, we also had Mercury active in its own sign of Virgo, uh, trining Jupiter. But, but now we kind of draw inward a little bit. And on the 11th, we also have Mars making a quincunx with Chiron. Again, this is a this can be a difficult energy. It's hard to get past our own unwillingness to forgive someone or to trust. Maybe there's a trust issue here. Um, um, it's it, it, it's it's just it's complicated is what it is. Um, and and yet we also have Venus retrograding now past its square to Uranus, but it's moving day by day now closer to a repeating its trine to Chiron. Um, and it'll do that exactly on the 14th. We'll get there in just a moment. Meanwhile, on the 12th, we have the moon obviously moving through uh, through Cancer, but on the twelfth we also have the sun making a trine with Chiron, and so we're getting some real Chiron emphasis here, not only from um, the Mars's quincunx to Chiron yesterday on the eleventh, but the sun's trine to Chiron here. Um, on on the twelfth, but there's something else coming into the picture that is even more significant, and that is, and I mentioned this at the very beginning and said we would be back to this, and that is uh, by the fourteenth. Um, and we'll get to the 14th in just a moment. Um, by the 14th, the Saturn half square, semi square to Chiron is exact. But even here on the 12th, um, the, um, the semi square from, from Saturn to Chiron, even on the 12th, is within one sixth of a degree. It's like eight minutes um, uh, a, a, of orb midday. And so this is really, really close. And this is a background energy also that I described earlier as a difficulty with finding um, a, a way to heal, finding a way to move through our, our pain, finding a way to be open to learning uh, the truth or to reach other others with our own truth. And yet at the same time, the sun's trying to Chiron on the 12th is relieving that a little bit, but there's deeper stuff still, still building there. The very intriguing period of time. Also, we have Venus retrograding back into the sun. Remember, retrograde Venus comes between the earth and the sun. And on August 13th at 4.15 a.m., we have Venus completely within the heart of the sun, Kazemi. It is, you know, when planets get close to the sun, um, whether it's the moon or Mercury that we can see or, or even, um, even Venus, when, when Venus gets close to the sun, we can't see it. It gets, it, it gets overshadowed by the intensity of the sun and it loses some of its identity. But when a planet is Kazemi in the heart of the sun, it's almost like it becomes the sun. And so on August 14th, when, when Venus is, is in the heart of the sun, when Venus is Kazemi, um, this is a very powerful time for that retrograde Venus to establish a moment of, of, of creation, of absolutism, of, of certainty around what it is, what it believes, what it needs, what it wants, where, what, it's, what, it, what it likes, all of those Venusian um, uh, intentions. Um, and that's on the 13th. Then as we get to the 14th, 
The moon moves into Leo at 3.36 a.m. The energy now is moving outward a bit more. We're, we're more open to expressing our love and our, our feelings and our emotions to put on the show, if you will. And of course, as the moon moves into Leo, we're approaching the new moon, which is exact on the um, 16th at 2.38 a.m. We'll get there in just a moment. Um, but here on the 14th, we do have Venus now making its exact trine to Chiron. Remember, the sun was making an exact trine to Chiron back on the 12th. Then we had Venus lining up with the sun, and now Venus on the four, that was on the 13th, and now on the 14th, Venus is making a trine with Chiron. In a way, kind of ma- waving her, m- its magic wand kind of glossing over all the difficulties and complications and making them okay. And yet, as if the universe is playing this crazy trick of mirrors on us, this is the day when Saturn's semi-square to Chiron is also exact. There's no escaping the fact that from the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, um, that Chiron is in high focus. It's in high focus both because of trines from the Sun and Venus, also because of the quincunx from um, Mars and eventually from um, from Mercury, which will move into that um, um, also, um, but also from this semi-square from Saturn. And it, it's complicated. And I think that it's important that we don't run and hide. This is not a time like the ostrich to bury our head in the sand. It's a time when we really need to face whatever the issues are around us and confront them or be confronted by them so that we can actually use this as a learning and teaching experience rather than one that just reinforces our denial. That's the 14th. Um, As we move through the 15th, we are also getting the sun, even on the 14th, we're getting the sun now making that square to Uranus, which I mentioned earlier. And Venus is not completely out of the question here, um, because, uh, you know, by, by noon on the 15th, we have the moon having made its square to Jupiter um, just a few hours ago. Venus already squared um, um, uh, Uranus, and it's retrograding back toward an exact square to Jupiter. Um, and the sun is now moving toward its square to Uranus. So again, things feel unstable. They feel, we might feel on edge. We feel like something's going to happen. Something's got to happen. <laughs> but it may not. But there is that sense of impending cataclysm or change or excitement or wonderful thing. The lightning is going to strike. Um, and, and that's on the 15th. And then by the time we get to the 16th and we have this new moon, which is at 2.38 a.m., um, 2.38 a.m., and this new moon is, I think, incredible incredibly significant because um, because it is so closely square to Uranus. Um, the, the, the new moon itself um, is at 23 degrees and 17 minutes, 23 degrees and 17 um, minutes of Leo, and Uranus is at 23 degrees and one minute, so it's within a quarter of a degree. Um, both the sun and and the moon will both make that um, square to Uranus uh, prior to the new moon, but it's electric. It's, it's going on like right now. And on top of that, um, the, the new moon at 23 degrees of, of Leo is not only squaring Uranus, but it's also at the same time um, that retrograde Venus is now still trining Chiron. It's about a degree off from being exact. And, and that's also in, in the past, so that's kind of easing, but it's still there and it's very powerful. And we also have something else now building with both Mercury and Mars um, still moving direct. Mercury still moving direct, but it's slowing down. 
and Mercury and Mars in Earth Virgo are moving into a trine with Uranus in Earth Taurus. I remember Jupiter is also in Earth Taurus. And they're both moving then into a trine with Pluto. Mars will get there, but Mercury will retrograde before it gets there. And so this is a very dynamic, practical Earth grand trine that we're beginning to feel around this new moon, even though there's certainly other energy going on, including the fact that at the full moon, at the new moon, um, Mercury is also making a quincunx with, with Chiron. And we, you know, we talked about how Chiron is so um, in the focus during this whole period of time. And um, Mercury's uh, quincunx with Chiron um, is exact on the 16th um, at like 11 a.m., um, just uh, hours after the new moon it, itself. So this is a very powerful period of time. And the other thing I want to mention here is that, remember, Mars makes that exact trine to Uranus on the 16th just hours after the um, the new moon. I mean, it's so close. Um, it, it, the trine is exact at 6:53 a.m. and the and the new moon is exact at 2:38 a.m. But Mars makes the trine with Uranus um, uh, um, at the new moon. But then Mars makes an opposition with to Neptune on the 22nd. And then it makes a trine to Pluto on the 24th. And that Mars trine to Pluto on the 24th, remember, we're still playing off the same grand trine energy that we looked at here at the new moon. Um, and I just also want to remind us that even though the Saturn semi-square to Chiron is waning, <laughs> it's still, you know, at the new moon on the 16th. It's still within... Um, four minutes of, of orb, that's one twelfth of a degree. And so it's still there. We're, we're, we're not done with the whole healing issue or the lack of healing issue that is being exacerbated at this point, even though we have some some uh, we have a path with the Mars trining Uranus of breaking through whatever the stalemated energy is, even though the moon itself, the new moon itself, is square Uranus. Uranus is absolutely in the highlight here. Very powerful day, August 16th. Very powerful uh, uh, lunation. Um, as we move ahead, um, by the way, uh, um, by 4.14 p.m., the moon moves out of Leo and into Virgo. And here we can uh, perhaps focus our um, energy uh, a bit more. And by midday on the 17th, we have the moon actually in Virgo having already made its opposition to Saturn. Things are a bit more serious now on, on, on the uh, 17th, um, even though some of the other aspects are beginning to wane. I mean, Mars is still closely trying Uranus. We can expect still an ongoing scene of excitement or, or craziness or releasing of, of built-up tensions that, that are occurring here on the 17th, even though the moon in Virgo is wanting us to hold that energy a bit quieter, a bit more um, cautious, careful may be the better word than, than cautious. Cautious is more like a cancer moon, um, uh, but there's this sense of discriminating and, and, and holding the energy until, until it's really right to express it. And remember, as that moon continues to move um, through Virgo by August 18th, that um, the, the moon will catch up with Mercury and Mars um, and eventually oppose Neptune just before um, Mars does it. We talked about Mars opposing Neptune on the 22nd. And so we're getting, again, this sense of what the hell is real here. It's hard to tell. Um, the grand Earth trine, though, is really cooking as Mercury and the Moon and Mars are all um, trining Jupiter and Uranus. And in fact, that Jupiter-Uranus midpoint um, is um, right around 19 degrees. And so as the Moon moves through 19 degrees, and Mercury did just yesterday, um, 
um, it, it, it's really pulling in all of that energy of Ju- of all the Earth planets, of Jupiter, Uranus, Mercury, Moon, Mars, and Pluto. Um, and it's very, very powerful, really kind of holding, I was going to say holding our feet to the fire, but it's more like keeping our feet on the ground. It's, it's like we're, we're feeling what is real and we, we, can't, we can't escape it. We can't escape it. That brings us up through the 18th. Um, by the um, <clears throat> 19th, the moon moves into Libra at 4.53 a.m. Um, and as the moon moves into Libra, we search for finding balance. We search for ways to be more um, um, to, to apply more fairness in whatever it is that we're doing. Remember, Mercury and Mars and Virgo might be precise, but they're not interested in being fair. They're interested in being accurate. The moon, as it moves into uh, Libra, it really reminds us that fairness is, is important. And by the 20th, the sun is now making a quincunx with Neptune. And this, again, is a bit of confusion. It's a bit of uncertainty that just doesn't seem to kind of ever quite get out of our system during these days. But the sun's quincunx to Neptune on one side is a quincunx to Pluto on the other side that's exact on the 21st. And so we're really getting this this, this energy of these quincunxes, um, even the moon moving through latter degrees of Libra on the 21st forms a quincunx with Neptune. Um, and so we're, as we're approaching this period of time, the very end of, of Leo, um, the sun is getting ready to move from Leo into Virgo, where it'll join up as it does once a year with the um, fixed star Regulus, one of the king stars which is basically a star that says you get what you deserve, you get fame and fortune and and royal energy, but you have to be careful of revenge. He who seeks revenge under the star of Regulus is surely doomed for failure. So this is just something to keep in mind as we approach um, the sun moving through the last degrees um, of Leo and into and into Virgo. Um, which it does um, on the 23rd, but still on the way there, on the 22nd, we have um, the moon moving into Scorpio. Actually, the moon moves into Scorpio late in the afternoon on Monday, the 21st. It's at uh, 4.22 p.m. Um, And now again, we forget we don't forget about fairness. It's just, it's less important than it is to hold a position and to get it right. And as that moon moves into Virgo um, on the afternoon of the 21st, we might feel more of a drive to, um, to take a position. But on the 22nd, we also have Mars making that exact opposition to Neptune. And so here, Again, it's easy to be misled by someone else. And in fact, also on the 22nd, we have Venus squaring Jupiter. Remember, Venus retrograding, now making that second um, of three squares to Jupiter. Um, the, uh, the, the first square was back at the beginning of June, or actually June 11th. And now it makes a second square. The third square is not until mid-September. But this is significant because, again, it's almost like if something feels good, we want to take it further. This is about extravagance. Again, Jupiter is confidence. It's overconfident. It's overdoing. Venus is about the sweet things. We can we can reach too far. We can spend too much money. You know, we need to pay attention because this combination of Venus squaring Jupiter, which is about you know, overdoing or about exaggerating is the same day as Mars opposing Neptune, which is energy being confused because we believe that what we can imagine is real, but it's not necessarily the case. Again, this can also be a wonderful day for expressing one's creativity, artistic side, for fantasy and role-playing and love. The magic of, of the power of fantasy here is is really important and really um, significant. Um, 
That's all on the 22nd. But by the time we get to the 23rd, the sun actually moves into Virgo at 2.01 a.m. And this is now the beginning of the ending of summer. Remember, summer doesn't end until the sun moves into Libra. It does that on the first day of autumn, um, which is um, in about a month because we have one month of the, um, of the sun moving through Virgo. But as the sun moves through Virgo through the end of August, the, uh, one of the first things that we will notice is its opposition to Saturn, which we will begin to feel once the sun actually enters Virgo, even though it's three days away, the actual sun's opposition to Saturn is exact on the, uh, uh, is early in the morning on the 27th, so it's almost four days, but <clears throat> this is all, we're in a transitionary period here, because also on this day, Mercury having not caught up to Mars at 21 degrees, and also not having quite reached its trying to Uranus, almost, 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 on the 23rd of August, Mercury stations and will begin its um, its 23-day um, retrograde uh, period. And so the 23rd is an important, important day because the Sun moves into Mercury's home sign of Virgo, and meanwhile, while Mercury, while in that sign, is stationary, and also Mars, toward the end of Virgo, is pushing toward a trine with Pluto, which is exact tomorrow on the 24th, and so the energy here is profound and powerful. Mars is coming off of its trine to Uranus, but it's moving toward its trine to Pluto, which is exact on the 24th, while Mercury is still in the range of its trine that it never quite reached to Uranus, and it'll move all the way back and um, and trine Jupiter again, um, but not until early next month, early September. So, powerful, powerful time. The moon moving through Scorpio will oppose um, Jupiter and Uranus on the 22nd and, and 23rd. Um, these are dynamic periods, dynamic days. Um, also, by the time we get to the 24th, that's when the Mars is exactly trying to Pluto. This is powerful energy that moves smoothly. It can be for good or for evil. It can be expressing either love or fear. But the fact of the matter is this energy is expressing and we can expect things to really flow here. And also the moon has moved into Sagittarius. The moon moves into Sagittarius at 1.07 um, a.m. And that is on Thursday, August 24th. Um, we have a whole different flavor of energy we've entered into now, even though the only planets that have changed signs are the sun having moved into Virgo um, and, um, and the moon having moved into its um, opening square to the sun as it moves into Sagittarius, but we're also nearing the end of Mars in Virgo. And, you know, Mars in Virgo um, is very focused, but when Mars moves into Libra, as it will on the 27th, um, it's again a very different flavor. And we'll get there in just, in just a moment. I want to stay here on the 24th just because I don't want to skip over the fact that while Mercury is stationed in its own sign, it's coming into a trine that it never perfects, it never finishes with Uranus, it backs away from it, but the Sun moving into Virgo is still opposing or coming into that opposition with Saturn. This is dynamic energy, it's not easy. And now on the 25th, we have Venus making a half square with Mars. Um, again, Mars is still in Virgo, Venus retrograding. Um, this is dynamic energy and it's complicated because in some ways, Venus and Mars are motivated to do something, but but I think it's hard for them to figure out what it is to do, especially since now Mercury is retrograde. And so Mercury is picking up power, but not moving forward. We're kind of going over old territory. And Mars is still trining to Pluto, giving us some depth, some, some power that's coming from very deep places. Even if we don't know what it is, even if we don't know how to work 
the energy. It's still coming up and we're still expressing it. Very powerful period of time here. Um, and um, and uh, um, on the uh, 26th, we have the moon moving into Capricorn. That occurs again in the morning at 6.05 a.m. Uh, the moon moving into Capricorn. By midday, it'll be trining the sun in Virgo and sextiling Saturn in Pisces. The moon will be at that point of Thales, that release point from the opposition um, of the sun and Saturn. Um, the opposition of the sun and Saturn is exact tomorrow on the 27th, but even today, on the 26th, that Sun-Saturn opposition is within, a, it's about a half a degree of, of orb. So it's already very, very powerful. Um, it, we're, we're running up against the truth, against reality. Sun-opposed Saturn is a reality check. It's a karmic point. It's a we get what we deserve point, whatever it is. And it's typically not all or nothing. Typically, some things work out for us and other things don't. Um, because the because karma is complicated. We're never all good or all bad. And so the areas in our life where we've been focusing and paying attention often can bring rewards or culmination, and we have to harvest and we have to do something about it. And then there are other things that we just simply need to let go of. Um, and I think that the moon moving through Capricorn in its practical and masterful way, I think will help give us the ability to make those judgments here on the 26th um, and by the 27th when the sun is reaches that exact opposition uh, to Saturn it does it very early in the morning at 128 a.m. But by the 27th, and that, that, it, that's the sun opposition, Saturn is at 128 a.m. on Sunday, August 27th. But also on August 27th at 619 a.m., Mars moves from Virgo into Libra. And once again, as a planet moves into Libra, like we talked about when the moon did um, uh, about a week ago, um, we have this need to be fair. And the moon moving into Libra gives us this ability to want to be in the middle of whatever the conflict is rather than on either extreme. We want to find ways to make it work, to be nice, to get people to get along. And you remember Mars is the Mars part of martial arts and Venus is the art part. Martial arts is like conflict with art and grace. And Mars in Libra, even though it's in its detriment, its exile, because it's as far away from its home sign Aries as it can get. Libra is opposite Aries. But as Mars is moving through Libra, if we can control the fiery edge of Mars of wanting to fight, we then can move into a more elevated realm of being able to even do more powerful work by being artful in our conflict rather than impulsively punching, instead working with the energy and dancing with it almost like a um, coyote you know, will dance with its prey rather than attacking it outright. And this Mars in Libra, I think, gives us the uh, opportunity or invites us to, to do that. On the 27th. Also, on the 27th, we have the sun making a square and a half with Chiron. And um, and that's exact later in the afternoon. Um, but again, here we have the same ongoing problem that we keep facing. And that is that every time we get close to a solution, there's some disruptive energy. There's a feeling like we can't heal. We're not going to resolve it right now. And that's that niggling part of Chiron that just doesn't seem to go away. And remember, Chiron here, um, not only does the... Um, does the sun make that square and a half to Chiron, but also Chiron is still in a half square to Saturn. So in a way, Chiron is really at that point of Thor, that, that exacerbating problematic point when there's an opposition and there's a planet like Chiron is now half square to one side and a square and a half to the other side. Um, and, um, and, and actually, um, that is something that I think will 
will feel quite strongly as we approach the end of the month once Mars has moved into Libra and once the sun is actually opposing, um, uh, opposing Saturn as it does on the 27th. By the 28th, Mars moves into, now it's Mars is in, in Libra, but Mars makes that square and a half with Jupiter. And, and again here, this, you know, Mars, Jupiter together can be really positive, but we can be overdoing, we can be overexpressing. And by the way, the moon, which moves into Libra, uh, I'm sorry, the moon, which moves into Aquarius um, uh, in the morning of the 28th, it actually does so at 7.31 a.m., um, and as it does, it makes a trine with Mars, which is going to give more power to, um, to that Martian energy of wanting to get things right in a way of harmony and balance, but we can overdo it because of its sesquisquare, its square and a half to uh, Jupiter that is on the 28th, and on the 28th, uh, we also have Uranus making its station. Uranus begins its retrograde phase um, on the 28th. And so for all practical purposes, we now have Mercury retrograde, Venus retrograde, um, Saturn retrograde, Uranus retrograde, Neptune retrograde, Pluto retrograde, and Chiron retrograde. Jupiter will turn retrograde shortly. It's already slowing down. But Mars is the only planet right now that just seems to be invincibly running through new space. But even Mars in Libra is a bit constrained because it doesn't pack its normal punch. It has to do it in ways that are seeking balance rather than victory. That's August 28th. Um, by uh, the 29th, we have the moon still moving through um, Aquarius, um, and it will make squares with um, with Jupiter and with uh, Uranus in fixed sign Taurus. Um, in fact, it will also oppose on the 28th and 29th, it will oppose uh, Venus. Um, and by the time we get to the 30th, we have... Um, now, retrograde Mercury making its exact quincunx with Chiron. Remember, Mercury made a quincunx while it was moving direct. Mercury made a quincunx with Chiron back on August 16th. And now it's making, as it moves retrograde, its second quincunx to Chiron. And the third and final quincunx that Mercury will make to Chiron will be not until September 27th when Mercury is moving direct and, um, and, and into new territory. But the point here, again, once again, we have that kind of Chiron in the midst of all of this being like a pain in the neck that won't quite resolve. And of course, also on August 30th, because the moon is moving through Pisces again, you remember the moon entered Pisces at 6.56 a.m., on um, on August on Wednesday August 30th and as such the moon is joining up with Saturn which is still making that half square with Chiron um, in fact Saturn half square to Chiron now is three quarters of a degree um, you know of orb so it's still less than a degree um, of being half square to Chiron and the moon as it sweeps through this point um, this morning kind of once again makes that whole feeling like it almost doesn't matter what we say or what we do it's still not going to quite resolve and it's not going to quite be the way we want it to be. Now, we end the month, though, in a very intriguing manner because we end it with what's sometimes referred to as a blue moon, which is not an astrological event. It's a old farmer's almanac term for the second full moon within one single month. And the second full moon, remember the first full moon of the month was on August 1st, and that was the full moon in Aquarius. And now we're getting the 
uh, full moon um, in Pisces, and it occurs at 6.35 p.m. And at 6.35 p.m., um, the, the moon and the sun are both at 7 degrees and 25 minutes. Uh, the, um, the, the moon at 7 degrees, 25 minutes um, of Pisces and the sun at, 20, at 7 degrees, 25 minutes of Virgo. And of course, Saturn is in this picture, as is Chiron, as we talked about um, earlier. Um, there's this whole um, piece of the discomfort of this Remember, Mercury is making that, that quincunx with Chiron that's very, very close. It was exact um, just a couple of hours prior uh, to the full moon at 4.55, um, a little bit less than two hours um, prior to this full moon. And so there's this complicating factor that things just don't quite feel right. And in a way, though, um, this full moon, so different than the opening full moon on August 1st, which was really about the difference between who I am and how I'm going to express myself, that's the sun in Leo, and the moon in, in Aquarius says, yes, but I feel like I need to pay attention to the bigger picture, the global issue, the culture, the family, society, and so on. Now, the awareness of this full moon, the culmination, is more about compassion, kindness. And with the moon close to Saturn, it's like we can harden up, but it's really important for us to take compassion seriously and to really do what we need to do. It's too easy to go into denial with the sun opposing Saturn or the moon conjoining Saturn. Uh, remember, even though it's a few days after the exact um, opposition of the sun to Saturn, that was on August 27th, um, we're still in the range of that. And so it's really important for us to use this energy of the sun in Aquarius to, to narrow our perspective so that we can actually aim our kindness, our compassion, our spirituality in the, in the right directions. Although I know spirituality isn't really directional, it's it's more effusive, it's more spreading. Certainly in, in Pisces, the moon does that. But I think that with the sun in Virgo, there is a need to just be conscious about what our um, feelings and how our instincts and how our reactions are manifesting in the real world and, and what, what effects it might have just before unconsciously just spreading our stuff around without even thinking that there are effects from us, from each of us individually as, 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 as a cause. So that's pretty much um, the month. I mean, there, there is, um, in, in, in fact, there, there is a 31st <laughs> to the month. Um, the moon is still moving through Pisces all through the 31st. Um, and uh, there is not any other outer planet activity. Um, there are things that are coming up that will that will kick in um, as we move into um, the uh, beginning of September, including Mars moving into a quincunx with Saturn. September 1st is not a comfortable day. Um, I think that's a Friday um, until later in the day when the moon moves into Aries past its conjunction to, to Neptune. Um, and I think that September can, in fact, start off with a, with a bang, with a, you know, with a bit of energy. Um, but we will get to that in a month. That's it for now. It's a, you know, it's, it's a very intriguing month because there's so much going on, but it's not necessarily completely new things that are unexpected. There is a lot of energy that's being tied to things in the past that will come back in September in the future. It's almost like, it's almost like August is, what there's a saying, it's betwixt and between. You know, it's it's kind of like it's it's not where we were and it's not where we will be, but it's kind of a bridge. And maybe that's what the uh, idea of, of August is. It's a bridge between the past and the future. And we're not quite done with the past yet, but we're not quite into the future yet. And I think a lot of things will be resolved by the time we move into and through September that don't get resolution in, in August. Quick reminder... 
for those of you who are um, patrons at the solar level, that's the $3 a month level, um, you will be getting, and, and all of those at higher levels, of course, also, you'll be getting the mid month um, update um, toward September 14th, 15th, 16th, somewhere in, right in there. Um, and for everyone else, I will see you back here again um, on, uh, on f- for the month of September, on September 1st. And I hope to see some of you at the uh, Astrology Night at Soul Food Coffee House in Redmond on um, Friday, August 4th. And others of you at some of the other events I mentioned at the beginning. That's it for now. As always, think cosmically, act locally. Think cosmically, act locally. These are not just hollow words. Astrology does us no use at all unless we apply the, the symbolism and the archetypal energy that's unfolding at the cosmic levels, unless we apply that to our individual lives, then why bother spinning all these wheels? That's it for now. I'm Rick Levine, and be safe out there. <laughs>